we've pretty much gone back to where we started in the game industry. And that's making a game with two or three different people. This is the only slide I could find because I couldn't get internet this morning when I added this. Uh, that's Braid, which uh, at least was a personal project uh, from someone with very little uh, development money. And um, we're now able to make uh, games for the iPhone, for uh, Facebook, and so on with very nice small teams, very little money up front. And uh, it seems like a good reaction to this bloat which has occurred in the industry. Um, the first type of game I'm going to talk about is uh, alternate reality games. And uh, we see up in the upper uh, right hand corner up there, oh, I don't have my, my pointer has a laser thing on it, so I can't do it. Um, that's from The Beast, that was originally a viral advertising game for Steven Spielberg's movie AI. Right below it is a screenshot from I Love Bees, which again was viral advertising, this time for Halo 2. Uh, in the middle there, one of my favorite alternate reality games from the Nine Inch Nails uh, album Year Zero. Um, and uh, over here is one that I worked on, Skeleton Chase. I did three versions of it. And I like that picture the best, even though it's from the second one. I'm going to talk a little bit about that. Oh, eight weeks of gameplay. 110-page design document. I guess I was learning, because it's much longer. But um, because we're using transmedia, most of it is, is uh, divided up into pieces, which is a good thing. Uh, writing designing in real time in the real world is the topic of this particular game. And uh, this was, uh, how many, everybody knows what an alternate reality game is, yes? OK. Um, this, this is the rabbit hole, or the trailhead, as it's, as it's called. This was an ad that was in a student newspaper in Bloomington, Indiana. And um, we had done uh, the original version of this for a tightly controlled group of students who knew precisely what they were getting themselves into. But this appeared in uh, a public uh, space. And uh, as a result, after uh, uh, it had appeared, we got a, uh, the chief of police of the uh, university got a call from a panicked uh, woman in the motor pool uh, who, said, who was, was very upset because we were predicting um, all sorts of bad things were going to be happening to Bloomington, Indiana, and she thought it was all real. Um, we had cleared uh, the game, we thought, with the uh, chief of police. We told him that there were going to be uh, probably reports coming in of flying saucers over the local cyclotron. And he sort of laughed and said, oh, we get those reports all the time. Um, so the first, the first thing to be careful of is the uh, Orson Welles' War of the Worlds uh, factor, which is when you're operating in the real world, sometimes people believe your game is real. And that can be dangerous. Um, another example of something that we faced in the game, uh, we went around what we call uh, is staging rooms, uh, which means that we, we dressed them, we decorated them as uh, offices for various uh, people who did not exist. And one of them was a student who could not afford to pay for housing because the university costs were so high. So he was camping out in a room at the top of this tower in the student student union and he had and we staged the room we, we dressed it with all sorts of junk food with all sorts of bottle empty bottles uh, that contained alcohol of various varieties and it was really kind of, it looked like a pigsty and we had to uh, take it down because it was a boardroom that was then used by uh, major people and then put it up again every morning so that players would have some time to find it one of the problems was that even though we cleared this with the student union, they had forgotten to tell their janitors. And so when the first team finally unraveled this intricate puzzle that took them all over uh, the landscape and came to the room, it was nice and clean. All of the props that we put in then there had vanished. When the puppet master who was on duty at the time ran over to the union when the team called in because we had a hotline, because we had to march this through eight weeks, uh, so they, the team called in, and we think we solved this puzzle, but there's nobody here. <coughs> so she ran over the union, and, and that's when they realized they hadn't told the janitors. She managed to track down the janitor in the bowels of the building. He still had the bag, and she tried to explain that it was for a game. 
he thought she was the person living there and drinking all that booze. Um, one of the problems that you face in ARGs, again, is that people take it way too literally. But um, this was to uh, test the efficacy. It was a, a grant from a health uh, uh, company to test the efficacy of doing games uh, to become healthier and fitter, but without teaching anybody anything. So all we did was run the students all over campus. They jumped over that fence on their own. Uh, that was probably illegal, but um, no one got arrested. That's another thing. We're very pleased about all the arts we run. No one has gotten arrested. Okay, uh, we did one more uh, version of this, actually, for Coca-Cola. This was on the uh, cover of the Glasso Vitamin Waters on the, on the label. Um, I, don't, I don't know if you've drunk this water before, but the label changes when it gets down into the white text. Everything above that was from the original, and then all of a sudden, something else is happening. We had these delivered to Coca-Cola executives who were staying there uh, for team building and learning about technology and so on. There we are, Coca-Cola, that's fine. The executives were from North Africa. So, the first challenge we had was that I'm the chief puppet master for these games, and I was not in Bloomington, Indiana at the time. Can anyone guess where I was? Nobody? Yeah. Sydney. Sydney, thank you. Sydney, Australia. With a, with a number of uh, wanted criminals, Ian Bogost, uh, Noah Falstein, and, and, and some others. And I was a long ways away, and as a result, with, that, uh, with the time difference and everything else, it was not always possible to see what was going to happen. The next challenge was culture. I asked this question very early on when I discovered where the executives were coming from, and I said, well, is there anything we should be uh, concerned about? No, 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 they're very sophisticated. They work for Coca-Cola was the answer. Unfortunately, that wasn't entirely true. Um, we had uh, teams divided up of Coca-Cola executives, and each one had an actor assigned to them, one of the characters in the story, and one of those actors was a woman, and one of, the te one of her teammates said that she, he would not take orders from women. And so we had to deal with that as well. The real world intrudes again, and finally, whether uh, there's nothing you can do about it if you're outside and it starts to rain except provide umbrellas if you can. Okay, so a key word in writing and designing of ARGs is flexibility because natural forces may change your game. Players will definitely change your game. Uh, we use all sorts of different transmedia, all sorts of different mediums, as many as we can. And as a matter of fact, this is one I've always wanted to use but haven't had a chance to yet in an arc hacked road signs. Um, they're actually pretty easy to reprogram. I don't know if I should be saying this out loud. Um, but you can turn them into just to say just about anything you want. And uh, if you happen to be a gamer, it could turn out like this. And I would love to use hacked road signs in an art someday. OK. Um, one of the things is that this didn't cost $40 million to put on this game. It cost 180000 uh, and we did it uh, two times for that amount, then got some more money from Coca-Cola. But the players still managed to be engaged. I think if you can get your players to crawl into a sewer while they're playing your game, they're probably interested in what's going on. Uh, and that's what happened. That poor guy thought that the, uh, uh, we did a GPS uh, geocaching uh, segment to the game, and he thought that the prize must be in that sewer. It was actually on that rock behind him, and another team had gotten there first. So he <laughs> climbed all the way through that sewer pipe. But again, he did not get arrested, and he did not die of any disease, so it's okay. All right, um, in 2000... <laughs> all right, this is a game that I worked on right before uh, the one I'm, I, I think I'm currently working on. I'm not entirely sure. Um, from Game Forge, Star Trek Infinite Space. Uh, it, it was supposed to re be released in June. It's not out. I'm not sure exactly when it's going to be released. Fortunately, I'm still under NDA on a lot of this, so I won't be able to talk much about this game, except that it was my first real casual game. And casual games have their own interesting things going with them. I had been a writer-producer of Star Trek Next Generation, which is the reason why I was on this particular game. That's my cast. Um, that's the game. And there's a problem here. Come on, go ahead. Oh, um, 
the game was actually based on the Deep Space Nine uh, universe that I knew nothing about because it's quite different from Next Gen. But I, uh, that was the cast there. I kind of knew who they were. And there was a problem. I couldn't talk about the game. So, to, to explain the kind of writing we did, I went back to an episode of Star Trek Next Generation that I wrote back in 1990. And uh, I'm going to talk about uh, two challenges to storytelling in any medium. One's the first is the creation, and the second is the delivery. One of the things that I've discovered as the games got smaller, so did the opportunities for storytelling. So, a new challenge is how to deliver the incredible shrinking story and still make it interesting. This is from Wikipedia. This is the... Uh, the synopsis of the story for this episode. All right, look at all those words just for the synopsis of it. However, if this were to be a, a, a story in a, a Star Trek Infinite Space, I couldn't actually use one that uh, we wrote for that, we, uh, I'll show you how we would divide it up. And the solution is what we call story bites. They're tiny little pieces of story. And for this, I didn't give you a chance to read all this. You'll have to trust me that this is the same story. Um, so basically, this is the setup. Um, <clears throat> this guy who's a friend of Beverly Crusher's disappears. And now there seem to be a whole bunch of crew members missing. And, they, and she wants uh, them to do, have Worf do a security check, but no one's ever heard of Worf. He's vanished as well, and nobody remembers. Uh, then, pretty soon, it's just Beverly and Jean-Luc uh, alone on the, uh, the bridge of the Enterprise. And this is not really what they were talking about, but this was what we call subtext. <laughs> All right, there was a, we always played with the relationship between the two of them. And then he vanishes right in front of her while the computer's monitoring, monitoring her, his heartbeat. And she wonders if anything can get any worse. And, of course, whenever anybody says that, she discovers she's trapped inside a warp bubble, it's shrinking, and it's trying to eat her. <laughs> and, oh, she fills out, figures out that actually that's what's going on, it's collapsing, her son is trying to rescue her, and she goes, she goes back to where the original warp bubble was formed, manages to dive through and lived happily ever after. That's that story in that many beats, and that's the kind of storytelling which we're now doing in casual and uh, social games. And I'll have another example of it, but that story was, was uh, turned into that. Okay, so another ch couple more challenges to storytelling in games, developers and publishers. Do we have any developers or publishers who are not writers in here? Ah, cool, okay. All right, um, sometimes they like to jump off before they really know what they're doing. Um, uh, uh, this is something that I learned just yesterday uh, from a friend who is still uh, writing for uh, Star Trek Infinite Space. I left the project uh, late spring, and uh, he said that I, I had written a whole bunch of missions, a uh, hundred missions, a bunch of other things, and um, the, the word came down from the producers that Star Trek, Star Trek never had any humor in it, so the game wouldn't match the original series. Um, uh, and so they cut out all the humor that I put all the way through the story, um, which of course is totally, totally nonsense. Some of the best um, watched and most loved stories of uh, the various Star Treks has, have been stories with humor in them. And usually all the stories have humor in them. Um, but I thought that was kind of funny to get that little bit of word afterwards. Um, now I'm, I'm supposedly working on this which is a Facebook game uh, that just came out about three weeks ago. And much to my surprise, about a week ago, it showed up uh, saying it's now an Indiana Jones game. It had always been an Indiana Jones clone, uh, although they were, they were careful to use the, the name Lara Croft instead. But that guy looks more like Indiana to me than he does Lara Croft. Um, this, this game did come out, I'm pleased to say. It has ongoing gameplay and no design document. Nothing ever changes. No design document at all. Um, so there's two new challenges in social network games I wanted to mention. Asymmetry and a, 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 that one, that second one. Um, asynchronous, I added that entity onto the end. I don't actually know if that makes it a real world word or not. 
in asymmetry is something that we do use in multiplayer games, which is um, I have a resource that you need and you have a resource that I need. And we do that whether it's a skill or a physical resource, like in this game it's oil or water or something like that, and we could therefore trade. It's a good thing to put in your game. The second one that was the most interesting challenge for me is uh, a synchronous uh, gameplay where instead of an MMO, I've worked on several MMOs, you're never uh, on the same screen with the people you're playing with. In fact, you may be playing with people uh, and, they, and they're doing something that affects you hours uh, apart from when you're doing it. Okay, so when I got there, six weeks before the game launched, um, and they'd been working on it for about a year, and there's another human being in the room who also worked on this game uh, many months before I did. Hal I may have something to say about it, I don't know. Um, these were the uh, story delivery systems they had. And remember, being a social game, they're smaller than tweets, these little pieces. So there would be a quest, or what they call the quest, was supposed to be part of the main storyline, but there was no main storyline. Expeditions were supposed to be apart from the main storyline. The only difference between them was they were repeatable and the others weren't. And you'd get one line, I need you to go get this. And then there would be, oh, thank you for getting that. And there would be some inc incidental NPC dialogue, I thought, which might be helpful while the quest was going on. There was a mentor journal that was really problematic because it was written by your mentor as if he had been to all the places you're about to discover. Well, this is a game of exploration. This is an RPG. You don't want to know that some, you're, you're stepping in somebody else's tracks. You're supposed to be discovering it for yourself originally. Uh, we were going to use real life characters. This is an idea that the studio came up with that I thought was a great one. And the first one was Amelia Earhart. She was actually, at the beginning of her career, flying in supplies and dropping them. And finally, something that everyone loves in Facebook games, virals and feeds, where they all your friends, uh, whatever, whatever small task they manage to fit complete in one of these games shows up on your home page and just makes uh, a mess. Um, and that was it. That's all I had to do, uh, all I had to work with to tell story. Now, I had requested some new ones. I wanted some more NPCs. There were only three. Uh, main NPCs in the game. Um, the player journal, I changed from the meta journal to the player's journal, so actually the player could record what they were doing in real time, so it was a little bit different. There wasn't anyone who had gone ahead of them. I changed all of the mentor's dialogue from, when I got there, I found giant spiders, to, I don't know, I've been reading the text about that place, there may be giant spiders there. Um, and I added idols, uh, where, so when the, the the NPCs are actually not doing anything useful. You can still click on them, and they will give you musings about various things. Uh, their own personal character revel revelation, not saying, geez, I'm like this, but uh, one of them complained about the conditions of the jungle. Another one was very happy with his job, which was uh, involved tools. Um, and they also are great for revealing story and character, uh, other characters, and the continuing story. Also, I added letters from the outside world from the player's Aunt Sally, back in the hometown. And finally, uh, Emily, who was the uh, uh, historian of this adventure society, um, she had files where you could go back and learn backstory, which was very helpful. Uh, I cut the story into these bites, uh, because they said, yes, we'll do all of this. Uh, some things happened along the way. Um, but, um, oh, there's some backstory down there, too. Um, now I'm just going to go to the next one. Players I created or changed. As, uh, Emily started out as a meal, this crotchety old guy. I changed him to a crotchety old woman. And uh, we got the word that no, she was going to be a cute woman. But at least it gave us the first woman out of the NPCs. Uh, we changed the tool shop proprietor. Actually, before he, was, he had nothing to do. He was part of the uh, artwork that was the tool shop. You couldn't click on him separately. And I, I pulled him outside of the tool shop so we could actually talk to him. Uh, I gave the, the, your mentor a character backstory and an arc moving forward. You find a relationship with the player. He starts out not really liking the player. He's because he's gotten a lot of new people coming there. Eventually the player uh, wins him over. Um, and I gave Amelia some more prominence because if you're going to have a real person, why not have them actually in the game? 
and I removed several one-shot minor quest givers and gave those quests to uh, major characters, and I'll, I'll show you one of those in a second. These are, so these are the delivery systems I requested. Here's what I got. Um, they cut my NPCs from five to two. Uh, the setting where I, I asked if we could actually um, uh, change some of the artwork, that didn't happen. Uh, the player journal stayed the same, my idol stayed in. Letters from the art side world stayed in. There was no increased use of radio, I just rewrote some of those. And Sally turned into Lady Octavia Wilde, who was a character based on uh, Judy Dench's M. And this week, uh, instead of getting letters from her, the first letter that popped out of the sky was from Indiana Jones, out of nowhere, with no explanation whatsoever. It was at that point that I decided I wanted to rant a little bit. Uh, Emily's files were cut, and the virals and feeds were the victims of Frontierville, another Zynga game, where the most popular thing in the game ever was when they did a piece of artwork and made a rather major mistake. That artwork involved that you were able to move sheep, around uh, your, uh, um, your set settlement, and the artwork made it look like the person standing behind the sheep was not actually moving it, at least not in the way they intended. <laughs> and they got such a great response from that, they immediately forgot that 60% that of their audience were women, and probably another large percentage were actually thinking human beings, and they changed all the viral and feeds into crude humor. And uh, as a matter of fact, the tagline for this game is now something like um, grab it by the boulders or something like that. And it's just all through the game now. Um, I, didn't, I, I did write some variations on the word tool, and I admit to rewriting some variations on the word booty. But uh, anyway. <laughs> Other requests that I had for them is a consistency of style. Most of the writing was done by the level designers, there were four of them. None of them seemed, they, they seemed to talk all the time, but none of them seemed to notice that none of their uh, levels matched. In short, we had talking monkeys in one, and then more realistic stuff in another one. Uh, there was no suggestion that it had anything to do with an Indiana Jones type adventure. It was more like what they've actually said now, which is an early, like a Nintendo 64 game. Uh, Mario or Zelda or something. Um, I asked that the uh, roles be uh, identified because I was coming in out of nowhere. A lot of writing had been done. I ended up in those six weeks rewriting 90% of the game. And it was a little unusual because no one ever knew who was reporting to who, to who else. Um, I, and there was no communication. The, 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 la the um, level designers would go off and have meetings by themselves, decide things, and forget to tell the writers. There was one other writer they hired, a part-time uh, uh, student, or no, he wasn't a student, but a new writer. Um, there was no writing pipeline. That we, I, I would send things to um, people and they would never get distributed to anybody else. I discovered that people were giving me notes on stuff that I had changed a month earlier. When you've only got six weeks, that's an issue. Um, no green light process. You'd put stuff in because one person said to put it in and then somebody else would say, no, take it out. Um, version control, no version control. Right as the game was about to be released, um, this, this young writer was writing some new virals and feeds, rewriting them because they didn't like the earlier ones. The earlier ones had already been rewritten. That document was on everybody's computer, they just, none of them had ever read it. Um, uh, there's no Bible for the game, and as I said, there's absolutely no design document for a game that is meant to go on for years. All right. Um, so, none of my requests uh, of those were granted. It, it remains like that to this day. All right, so back to actually doing something. Um, this is uh, one of the, the stories I took it away, uh, one of the quests I took it away from an, an NPC we didn't care about, gave it to Emily. Um, it starts out as various idols that play out over the weeks that you're playing the game. These didn't all just occur uh, at the beginning. She first says, my go back in the States as a librarian, every time I smell an old book, I think of him. It's very romantic. Um, and then she's, we start to get the feeling that maybe the relationship isn't going so well. Um, and then she indicates that maybe we can help somehow. And that was like in the third aisle. Am I out of time? 
Okay, almost done. Okay. Um, and then we and then we have another one of the uh, NPCs uh, comment on it. Then we have the actual quest bestow and reward, where you go and, and find uh, ingredients for a love potion. You get, as she's very pleased, she sends it to her bow in a box of candy. Then she's really upset because it gave uh, uh, her bow diarrhea. <laughs> and uh, Ken finally says one final thing about that story. That is a way to do an entire story arc between two characters and a bunch of tiny little uh, lines. What I'm working on right now is Emergent Reality Lab, and I'm not going to go into this. Ask me about it later on, because it's, it's, like it's like a holodeck. And what we're doing is using, we're, we're building it for research and education, and we are um, actually, the first one is Mandarin Chinese. We're taking people uh, to Beijing, to the Forbidden City, but they're actually not leaving uh, upstate New York. And uh, we're testing whether or not this kind of immersion, similar to what we did with the arts, um, actually uh, makes people learn the language better than sitting in a classroom. And uh, the Incredible Shrinking Game, should writers be scared? No. Writers should not be scared because every time they give us something, some new hurdles, and even though the stupid people seem to always be in the industry, we know how to write the stuff they want us to write or we're not doing it for real. And as the example I'm going to use, if you think I'm using uh, uh, the phrases are too small for me, Man named Ernest Hemingway, not much of a boxer, but a pretty decent writer, wrote this. Yeah. Right? That's six words, and it creates emotion in the person that reads them. And if they can, if Ernest Hemingway can do it in six words, we can probably do it in eighty <laughs> or something. I don't know. Anyway, that's it. I, I, I like to sell my books, so that's what those are. getting bored teaching. I'd only been teaching for about three years and I was already getting tired of standing up here or sitting up here like this and lecturing and having the students text to each other <laughs> instead of listening. Um, and I thought, well, what can I do to change the teaching method? I thought, I'm a game designer. I wonder if... And so the first class I went into, I, I, I got in front of them. They were all uh, freshmen in university. And I said, hi, welcome to class. You all have an F. And they, yeah, they went, because of course, if it's their first year at university, they actually believe what professors tell them. And then I said, ah, but you can level up. And as soon as I said that, instead of them going, oh, they kind of went, oh yeah, bring it on. <laughs> and from then on, they were engaged. And, and they, I divided them into guilds. Uh, we had, um, we did tons of games, results, almost perfect attendance, they were coming early to class, uh, they were actually making up their own assignments because they were having so much fun. The average grade went up an entire level for the class. I had a, an average grade for a class um, last semester that I didn't put in the book because I didn't think anybody would believe me. The average grade was A or one. Um, and they're coming out of the class, and one of the questions I get is that, well, but how, they've taken this class as a game, and it's exactly like playing a multiplayer game. How is it going to work when they go to uh, another class that they're back with this, what we call Sage on the Stage? And um, the, what's turning out is they actually retained more from the earlier class, they do better in that class. So it's going really well, it's, it's virally spreading, um, a teacher will try it, and it's, it's, it's in uh, early education now, high school education, and universities. And uh, when one teacher uh, tries it and it succeeds, another teacher next door wants to try it. And uh, the one th another question I got about it is, well, if you're not a game designer, how can you possibly teach this way? And the answer is, even if you've never played a game, trust me, there's gamers around you <laughs> who will be delighted to help you, and as a, as a couple of the case histories in the book say, it's exactly what happened. Uh, how did you handle multiplayer and just like make it fair? Um, well, the I mean, there's that, this this is a discussion that could go on for hours. Um, but basically, I identified the kind of the ways they learned and what their skill sets were. I had artists in my class, I had programmers in my class, I had writers in my class, 
and I made sure that when I divided them into guilds, that there was one of each, at least on each one. So, and then, and then I um, allowed uh, one person in a guild, if they do something right, then uh, everyone in the guild gets credit for it. And there's no going backwards. They're just leveling up. They're just adding XP. So uh, they're not like looking at um, uh, what their next grade is going to be. They didn't care. 